Overwatch is the only game I've ever played that's designed to make it easy and in some ways even encourage you to be bad at it. It's remarkably easy to be awful at Overwatch, and as I dove back in on a fresh, unranked PC account to see how the game has changed, I was hit with a startling realization. Overwatch's popularity has everything to do with it almost conditioning bad behavior. Now that's not to say it's not a good game, that's not at all what I'm saying. What I am saying is this manifests itself in a bit of a paradox, and today I want to break that paradox down. In Overwatch's quest to become accessible, it simultaneously makes some of the most ingenious design decisions in multiplayer gaming, while also managing to, in similar ways, prohibit the growth of its players. If the point of a competitive multiplayer game is to get better, Overwatch is significantly more concerned with giving you reasons to feel like you don't really have to. Let me be clear, this is both a great and not so great reality of the game, but it's one that does not apply to high level play. Good players are using these heroes dramatically differently than anything I'm discussing here. So heed that warning. I think to understand why and how this is, it's important to first get some context as to the game's strange MMO roots. Overwatch's success is actually a bit surprising given that the game was born out of total and complete failure. A game known as Titan began development around early 2007 within Blizzard. It was a class-based shooter, with each class having a core set of abilities that the player would expand upon via a skill tree progression much like an RPG. These skills got more powerful the further the player progressed, and these systems became more nuanced. Jeff Kaplan, a lead on Titan, said that it ended up being very cluttered and confused. Blizzard co-founder Michael Morheim stated that with Titan, they didn't find the fun, they didn't find the passion even after re-evaluating the project years down the line. And thus, after nearly seven years of development, energy, money, and time, Titan was completely scrapped. The large Titan team of 140 development members was broken up. 80 were permanently relocated to other divisions in Blizzard, 20 put on loan to other Blizzard projects, and the remaining 40 tasked to come up with a new project within just six weeks, otherwise they too would be assigned to other groups within Blizzard. This team of 40 spent those six weeks tossing around many ideas. One was an MMO, another was a StarCraft tie-in, and eventually, the team came to a realization. They wanted to do something new. They wanted to take the state of the modern FPS, the rising MOBA genre, and combine the two and innovate on both to create something unique. Thus, Overwatch was born. The game was built utilizing a different development approach than other shooters, and it's part of the reason Overwatch became different than other shooters. The game from the bottom up has always been hero first. Development started with the creation of the first hero, Tracer, who is based on a character meant to exist within the cancelled Titan. They set Tracer in the first map, Temple of Anubis, and began testing gameplay around this foundation. Widowmaker, Reaper, and Pharaoh would follow each characters that would have been classes in the MMO idea tossed around before landing on Overwatch. And it was around this time that the idea of accessibility became a mantra of development. By the time Overwatch eventually hit store shelves, its mantra was intact, its development goals reached, and it would hit store shelves not in beta, not in early access, but as a complete and finished product. But is Overwatch anything more than just accessible? Is it anything more than the heroes within it? Is Overwatch worthy of the praise it has received? Let's take a look at the first thing that Overwatch does get right. Overwatch is split into three subclasses, tank, DPS or damage, and support. Each class has heroes designed from the ground up to be almost laughably easy to play and feel as though you're contributing whether you are or aren't. Let's start with a less obvious support choice, Moira, who you will see in basically every other match. This character is essentially a metal simulator. She requires only the most basic and imprecise aiming ability from the player, being that her damage beam, which is continuous, only requires you to aim near or around the body of an enemy to latch onto it automatically. Dealing damage becomes an exercise in looking towards an enemy, not directly at it. Her orb ability proffers a similar reality. Toss an orb towards the enemy team and as long as it's reasonably well placed, you'll quickly hear that damage ticker ringing. The same applies to her wide healing beam and healing orb. She is designed to be able to be played by even the most mechanically inept and unskilled player. She's designed to reward you just for participating. It's easy to rack up medals simply by tossing orbs and holding right click. She's constantly proffering the player feedback by giving you constant trash damage and unearned limbs. She has a high skill ceiling, a good Mara can change a match, but you don't need to be good to feel like you are with this hero. There's a similar sentiment with Mercy, a hero whose beam just needs to be in the vicinity of an ally, a hero who can fly to an ally within her vision with a click of shift, and a hero who can even participate in damage dealing with her alt fire. 
which boosts the damage output to whoever you're aiming it at. The point with these two heroes isn't that they're easy to use. They are, but again that isn't the point. Because both have high skill ceilings and can be very difficult to use well. The point is instead that both are designed to make you feel like you're better than you are at lower levels. They're both designed to make it easy for you to feel like you're contributing, and by designing these heroes this way, their refusal to offer negative feedback gives you less incentive to learn from your mistakes or better yet, to even recognize them. If I die in Rainbow Six Siege, for example, I know why, and if I die right away in a round, I know I've hurt my team. I also have not contributed or I've done so negatively. The scoreboard shows it. In COD, I know my KD isn't up to snuff, and I know that's eating into our score. Even in NBA 2K, I know that stupid deep three I took on the last possession cost my team that possession and the potential for points. The point is, I understand when I'm hurting my team in almost every other competitive game. Overwatch, on the other hand, designs heroes like Mercy and Mara to make that negative feedback almost non-existent and instead overwhelm you with positive reinforcement for every action. This creates two positives and a negative. First off, this makes the game a lot more fun and in some ways less toxic than other multiplayer games. It also makes the game more relaxing and encourages players to actually give the less popular hero roles, like support, a shot but it also panders to the player in ways that don't stimulate your skill progression. Tanks are an even more interesting look at this design choice, however. This is Reinhardt. A really good Reinhardt can carry a match, can be the rock you need to progress past the next checkpoint, he can be your best friend. But anyone can play him, and that's a huge credit to the design team. Reinhardt is so simple to understand. Hold up your shield, protect your team. When it goes down, swing hammer or pin enemies, and repeat. But great players know how nuanced his actual strats are. Not everybody's a great player, and you don't have to be great with Reinhardt to have fun. Anyone can walk in front of the payload, shield up, and lay the hammer down on their enemies. There's no skill required in those realities, and if you're well supported and your DPSs do their job, you'll stay alive. Reinhardt is the right kind of easy to play. There's no overwhelming celebration of your actions every 10 seconds. It's protect and stay upright. No medals, fewer limbs, fun, but without your improvement, you'll never see an accolade. You don't ever feel like you can't get better or don't need to. And then there's D.Va. Very high skill ceiling, again, but the ultimate trash damage accolade collecting metal getting tank. Simply in the context of ease of use. Great divas can be a great help, but the worst divas are doing nothing. Divas weapons have a massive spread and fairly reasonable range. And even once you get outside of the range of her WAN weapons, enemies at a distance will still trigger that damage tick. Her dive mechanic can boop you right off the map for an easy kill, or at least deal some damage. Her ult is a ticking time bomb that can wipe a whole squad with skillful or even lucky placement, and most importantly, she lives multiple lives. See, while she can eat damage, inexperienced players forego her matrix and simply fire forever, racking up trash of limbs, damage medals, and flying in and out of trouble without supporting their team. But even when they go down, they pop out of their mech and pop shot until they've gotten it back, and live their second life, rinse and repeat. Diva's widespread, flashy old flying mech is constantly rewarding you with positive feedback and does everything it can not to punish your mistakes, requiring very little aiming skill while in mech and an easy way to get out of trouble with flight. Diva is excellent in good hands, but in new hands or even poor hands, she's designed to make you feel powerful as she should be, but designed to make you feel again like you're contributing even if you aren't. Designed to keep you alive for as long as possible, even if you aren't helping your team, even if that means exiting team fights, and she's everything you need to convince yourself that even if your team loses, it wasn't your fault, so I get better. You participated in over 60% of eliminations. You got a gold in hero damage. You got a gold in objective kills. It couldn't have been you. And Overwatch really drives all this home in that presentation and progression. Overwatch made a design decision that the dev team cites as taking a stand against individual play in competitive games, but maybe created an altogether different, albeit more complex, beast. 
Well, really, it was two decisions. Overwatch wants you to play the objective. It wants you to play as a team, but it also wants you to always run on a sugary high of positivity and in-game hoorahs. So the game removed the KD statistic from both in-game and post-game menus. Better yet, a kill or elimination became the statistic shown, and to get one, you simply had to deal some amount of damage to the eliminated enemy at some point during the course of their current health pool. So even if you did just 13% of the damage to the Reinhardt, as long as he goes down, swinging or not, you've gotten that sweet Alim message. And these are both excellent decisions. They do a wonderful and reasonable job of removing the focus on kill chasing, and better yet, removing a trite statistic, not necessarily indicative of skill from the game altogether, by removing the traditional kill stat. But by creating the medal system in its place and making it almost impossible not to receive some medal by the end of the match, and by stacking on top of that the post-game accolade card system, they create a cycle of positive reinforcement that while amazing in a world of multiplayer toxicity, also breeds complacency and skill. The underlying message of this piece. How many times have you heard someone say they should be ranked higher because they're always getting golds in X category or other category? Or they carried because they had four medals? Or their team was trash because they lost and he had gold limbs on support? Probably a lot. By making everyone feel like a success, you've created a false sense of progress amongst low to mid-tier players. Now, smart players of any rank, even low ranks, know when and how they can improve. So this isn't everyone, but for far too many players, these accolades are viewed as reasons to blame others or reasons not to look inward at their own performance. They are silver because they're solo queuing and keep getting bad teammates, or worse yet, they become bad teammates chasing medals because they feel as though it separates them or will contribute to their placement. This all reaches its finale with a system that has apparently reduced toxicity in the game by 40% according to Blizzard, the endorsement system. This system is great because it clearly does encourage positivity and curb some of the more undesirable behavior as Blizzard would probably put it, but it also rewards you with 50 XP every time you endorse someone else post-match, and it gives you three chances to do so. So, those looking to get 150 extra XP every single match, which at lower levels, to be a fair amount, will endorse anyone just for the XP. Meaning a bunch of bad teammates are being reinforced as good teammates, regardless of their play, further cementing their bad in-game habits. A system whose pros probably far outweigh its cons, but a system that does have its cons. Every day on forums and even blog posts, you'll see people arguing that either there's too big of a skill gap in Overwatch or there's not big enough of a skill gap. But for those in the camp believing that there's too big of a skill gap, these realities are probably a pretty good contributor to that gap. They're probably a good reason why players lapse so often. And that's really the underlying sentiment to all of this. Overwatch does so much to make you feel like you're contributing, so much to make you feel like you're having a positive experience, and so much to provide a constant stream of that positivity, both visually and mechanically, that eventually that pomp and circumstance gives way to what at times feels like debilitating pandering. Pandering that gets in the way of players understanding when they've done something wrong, or where they can get better, or when they're not really contributing to the success of their team, only the success of themselves. Now this is far from all bad. I love that Overwatch is all about making you feel happy and involved, but it's hard to imagine that these mechanics and design choices haven't also contributed to some of the toxicity, and that a good portion of the lapsed player base might be lapsing because these systems aren't as stimulating as they should be. Let me be clear, I still believe Overwatch is not only fun, but an excellent use of your time. Over the years, I've logged over 130 hours on console, and now dozens more on PC, and while I don't consider myself a hardcore player or a core member of the Overwatch community, I do absolutely think the game is worth your time. This is not a video about a bad game being bad, it's a video about a good game and how its design decisions fight amongst each other to create something both special and strange. Overwatch is one of the most interesting cases of design paradoxes in gaming. Sometimes behind the smiles and the rainbows, in my opinion, there needs to be a little bit of rain. So you know how to stay atop those rainbows forever. Maybe just maybe Overwatch could every once in a while use a little drizzle.
that is it for today's video guys as always i want to know what you think are you still playing overwatch are you going to pick it up on switch are you interested in the game at all at this point if you stop playing it why did you if you aren't interested now what is it about you that's got you uninterested i know we are time to be talking about a blizzard game but this video has been in the work for weeks as most of you know on twitter this all just kind of came at a weird time but let me know what you think about overwatch in general are you gonna keep playing it are you gonna keep supporting blizzard let me know in the comments down below as always if you enjoyed this video press the like button if you have not yet subscribed press that little subscribe button as well that way you don't miss any content coming to this channel also with the little bell next to the subscribe button that little bell just makes sure that you're actually notified when videos come out that's all it's for it just makes sure you actually receive them so press that little bell next to the subscribe button and until next time guys i'm out